And today we're going to look at a, a very important topic, kind of two rolled into one, which is the second coming and the millennium. Uh, and I wanted to read out a scripture for us first before we, we, before we begin in Revelation chapter 20. Turn with me there to Revelation 20. This is our scripture reading for this morning. Revelation chapter 20. And reading through verses 4 and 6. This is a description of what the millennium will look like. This period of a thousand years that God and his people spend together. It says, And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received the mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. But the rest of the dead did not live again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with him a thousand years. Let's bow our heads to pray. Heavenly Father, we just pray that as we come and we read from your word and as we study this important topic, that your Holy Spirit would be with us, that you would remove anything from our hearts or minds that would prevent us from hearing this message. God, I pray as well that you be with me as I speak. Give me the right words. Please uh, equip me to be able to present this message. I pray this in your name. Amen. So why is it important to understand the second coming and the millennium? If you're to ask a lot of Christians from a diverse amount of denominations, a lot of people would say, well, it's not too important to understand the chronology or how the events take place. All that matters is that one day Jesus is coming back. And for that matter, they might say, it's really hard to understand the books of Daniel and Revelation. So it's a bit unclear as to what the second coming is going to look like. Now, if you were to ask perhaps a, a Seventh-day Adventist the same question, we would say that it is very important to understand the events of the second coming and the millennium and that we can understand the events of the, uh, the text of Daniel and Revelation. A lot of the time you'll also hear said, well, you don't have to perfectly understand the, the end time events in order to get to heaven. That's what you'll often hear. And there's a, perhaps a kernel of truth to that. It is true that when we get to heaven, we don't have to create a perfectly drawn prophecy chart to get in. That's not a test of entry. However, misunderstanding the events or not knowing the events leading up to the second coming and the millennium, while it's not a matter of salvation, it can put our salvation in jeopardy. Why is that? Because scripture tells us that right before the second coming, there's going to be incredible spiritual deception. And part of that spiritual deception will be a misunderstanding of Jesus' second coming. So understanding the events of the second coming and the millennium, they're actually of eternal importance. They can actually ensure that we're not deceived right before Jesus comes to take his people home. So this morning, what, we, what I want to do for us is look at what are the broad views that the Christian world has of the millennium? How do we as Adventists fit into that? And why is it important to have the right view of how the millennium takes place? Now, a lot of these views, they have long and foreign sounding names, but I don't want us to be intimidated because the names do make sense. And I've also given each of them a simple nickname to help us remember what each of these views is about. Uh, not only that, uh, in order to understand it, we have to know each of these views is named after when the second coming of Jesus happens in relation to the millennium, this period of a thousand years. So the first category of these views is what we call pre-millennialism. In this view, the second coming happens, when do you think? Before or after? If it's pre, 
it would be before. The second coming happens before the millennium, before the thousand years. So are we as Seventh-day Adventists, are we pre-millennial? Yes, we are. We believe the second coming happens and then the, the millennium comes after or the second coming precedes the millennium. Now, in addition to that, we're not only premillennial, we also have a view of interpreting prophecy. And that view we refer to as historicism. What does historicism mean? All it means is that we see the prophecies of the Bible as covering all of history. It's this beautiful tapestry that goes all the time from all the way from the time the biblical authors write through to our time through to the second coming and beyond. It goes all across history. That's what we mean by historicism. So this view, in order to make it a bit simpler, premillennial historicism is a bit lengthy, right? It makes sense, but it's a bit hard to remember. So we could refer to this simply as the prophetic timeline view. We see prophecy is going all across time and it culminates with the second coming and then the millennium. Now, this view was held by the Millerites in America, and it's actually been held by many Christians all throughout history. And importantly, this was the view which God himself to be revealed to be true to the Seventh-day Adventist movement, particularly through the prophetess Ellen White. And remember that we spoke about these Millerites, they were looking forward and anticipating the second coming. They were looking forward to Jesus returning, but this sweet experience turned into a bitter one we now refer to as the great disappointment when Jesus didn't arrive as they anticipated. And we understand that they had the date of that prophecy correct, but the nature of its fulfillment they had misunderstood. Now, in the wake of the great disappointment, the wider Christian world in America kind of lost interest in the prophetic timeline view. Because the other Christians were saying, if the prophetic timeline, it finishes in 1844 and it ends with this great disappointment, then does this view hold any water? Now, of course, we know God was leading his church uh, and he led them through that time of disappointment. But the wider Christian world didn't see it the same way. And so many different Christian groups started looking for alternative ways to understand prophecy in the time of the second coming. Now, these Christians, they still were excited about this promise of the second coming. So the first alternative they came, they came up with was still premillennial. They still wanted to see the second coming of Jesus happen very soon. But they wanted a different approach to prophecy. They didn't like this historic timeline view anymore. So what would they substitute it with? Well, it just so happened there was another group who really didn't like historicism or the timeline view. And that was the Roman Catholic Church. Many of the Christian reformers, they held to this view. And they could plainly see that the tyrannical oppression of the church during the Middle Ages, it fulfilled the description of the Antichrist in the Bible books of prophecy. So to divert that prophetic attention away from themselves, the church created a new way to interpret prophecy, which they refer to as futurism. Futurism, rather than seeing the prophecies of Scripture as all throughout history, futurism takes those prophecies and throws them into the future. Makes sense. They throw it right over into the future, and then the church was able to say, well, we can't be the Antichrist, because the Antichrist is a future enemy of God and His people. We can't be us. We're not the culprits. It was a way to divert that attention away from themselves. Now, because it was so clear this was just a way to divert attention, the Protestants weren't futurists for the longest time. They saw it for the ploy that it was. They went, we're not interested in futurism. You're clearly just trying to get away from uh, the, the scriptural evidence. But after the Great Disappointment, many of these Protestants embraced futurism because it was an alternative view. They were looking for any alternative. And so many decided to become Premillennial, but futurist. Now, this is where we get many of the ideas about a secret rapture, a seven-year tribulation period, um, 
that the Antichrist is a singular person rather than a group or an entity. Uh, many of these ideas that we hear in other Christian circles come from futurism. And we'll call it the secret rapture view, to make it simpler. This is the one, the view that's very common in Christianity today, that there's a secret rapture and the Antichrist is a political figure rather than uh, a group or an entity. Uh, and it has to do a lot with rebuilding Jerusalem and the temple there uh, in Israel. So that was the first alternative the Christian world created. The second one is a bit unusual. The second alternative they created was no longer premillennial. That is, Jesus arrives before the second coming. A new alternative was postmillennial. What might postmillennial mean? Jesus' second coming happens after the millennium. That sounds strange to our ears, doesn't it? It just it, it seems the order is the wrong way around. But this was another alternative that was proposed. Now, as Adventists, we clearly, we can read in Revelation 20 when the millennium happens. Jesus arrives in Revelation 19, the second coming. Revelation 20 follows on. It seems very clear. And yet the post-millennialist believes Jesus' second coming happens afterwards. Here's what they believe. Uh, they didn't believe in historicism or futurism, but in the second alternative the church created, which was preterism. Preterism, if futurism threw the prophecies into the future, where do you think preterism throws prophecy to? Back in the past, the distant past. It was another way for the church to say, we're not the, the beast of revelation because that happened ages ago in the distant past. So the post-millennialists, they view biblical prophecy as being almost entirely already fulfilled. Everything to do with the beast, the mark of the beast, persecution, spiritual and moral decline of the world. They say that already happened way, way in the past. So if you take away all of the prophecies of scripture that talk about things getting progressively worse, what are you left with? All of the prophecies of things getting progressively better. All that's left for the post-millennialist is these prophecies of God and his people reigning in victory. So the post-millennialist actually believes that the Christian world will reach this golden age in which the entire world becomes Christian. The entire world uh, shares Christian values and is worshipping God for 1,000 years. And that once this golden age of Christianity is established, after that 1,000 years... Jesus comes to inherit a kingdom on earth. He rules over the earth, receiving this perfect, uh, this perfect kingdom that has been created for him. Now, the reason this was very popular was in the 1840s and 50s, the culture was seeing immense advances in technology, the sciences, culturally, politically, Everything was advancing, and so Christians were optimistic, and they were saying, hey, what if we can not only advance society in all these different areas, but also in the Christian world? What if we could establish this golden age of Christianity? But this view, it fell out of favor heavily after World War I and II, because people realized these advan uh, advances, they can not only be used for good, but also for evil. And after the first two world wars, most Christians who were post-millennial kind of lost any hope that a golden age could be created in the world. How could they feel that way after seeing the atrocities of, this, uh, of these two world wars? So let's quickly review. What are the, the different views that the Christian world has about the millennium? The first category we said was, Premillennial, and that is Jesus comes before the millennium. And I'm sorry, the formatting's uh, a bit jumbled up. I apologize for that. And we said that we're premillennial and we are believing historicism. That is prophecies, this timeline. We said it's the prophetic timeline view. Then there are those who are premillennial but believe in futurism. That's the secret rapture view. And then there's a strange group that say the second coming is after the millennium and they're preterist. All of the bad prophecies or the prophecies that appear negative are fulfilled in the past 
and we're going to live in a golden age. That's the golden age view. Now, I know that's uh, a lot of history, a lot of info, a lot of words, and there's a temptation to feel like this is all theoretical and abstract. But remember, we said at the start, misunderstanding the events of the second coming of millennium can put our salvation in jeopardy. So is it important to know about these events? Yes, it's of eternal importance. So this isn't, uh, we're not talking about abstract ideas here. We're talking about very real realities that affect uh, people's salvation. So now we're going to take some time to evaluate these different views. Specifically, we're going to look at post-millennialism or the golden age view. But before that, we want to see what does the Bible have to say, right? We, we know what people are saying. What does the Bible have to say on this topic? Specifically, how does the Bible describe what the world will be like right before Jesus' second coming? We know uh, the famous chapter in Scripture is Matthew 24, refers to all of these uh, different ways in which the world is kind of breaking down with wars and famines and earthquakes. Uh, And interestingly, in Matthew 24, Jesus concludes by saying, Assuredly, I say to you, this generation will by no means pass away, till all these things take place. Uh, Now, Jesus was referring both to the destruction of Jerusalem and the generation before his coming. So just as the generation that saw the destruction of Jerusalem, they saw all of these events take place, so also the generation right before Christ comes will see these famines, these earthquakes, false messiahs, all of the signs we read in Matthew 24. But let's turn to 2 Timothy together. Open up your Bibles to 2 Timothy. Uh, Actually, 1 Timothy. We'll do 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4. To get a description, what does the world look like right before Jesus comes? Uh, And I've got there as well 2 Timothy 3, 1 to 5. We won't have time to go through that this morning. Take time to read that this afternoon. It talks about the moral decline of the world, how uh, spiritually and morally there's this rapid decline of the world before Jesus' second coming. But we're going to come to 2 Timothy. Oh, no, sorry, it is 1 Timothy. I got my first and second mixed up. 1 Timothy chapter 4. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verses 1 and 2. says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times... Some will depart from the faith, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. So when, what time period is this describing? Paul says to Timothy, it's in the latter days or the latter times. And he describes that there's this going to be a big falling away from the Christian faith. And not only that, people are going to go after doctrines that have their origin from deceiving spirits and demons. So far from this description of a Christian golden age, uh, where the whole world converts, Paul says that in the latter times, there's actually going to be a massive departing from the faith and that many Christians will heed after deceiving spirits. We get more of a description of this in 2 Thessalonians. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. This is again Paul writing to a church, the church in Thessalonica. And he gives more detail as to what this falling away from the faith is going to look like. 2 Timothy chapter 3, uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and beginning in verse 3. Paul writes, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing that he is God. So Paul, his warning here is, he says, that day, what day is he referring to? The second coming. That day will not come unless 
this falling away comes first, this departing away from the faith. And specifically, he says, the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. This man of sin character, in verse 4, he exalts himself to be in the position of God. He puts himself above everything. So there's this description of, again, not this Christian golden age, per se, of genuine faith, but in fact, there's a big falling away. Many uh, Christians are deceived by this man of sin who arrives on the scene before Jesus returns. And in verse 9 and 10, we're told that this man of sin, he works power and signs and lying wonders through the power of Satan. So Satan is actively propping up uh, and is working in tandem with this man of sin character. Now, the, the, so what's important from these passages that we're reading through is that unlike what the post-millennial or the golden age view says, Christianity doesn't see this uh, increase of perfect, uh, uh, this perfect world. Uh, the world that Jesus comes to, it's not one in which everyone's acting perfectly and super morally. It's a time of spiritual and moral decline. That's the condition of the world before the second coming of Jesus. Now, there's also a, re a true revival that takes place in God's church within the remnant church. But the broader world is suffering this decline. Now, the fullest explanation we get of this is in Revelation 13. Let's turn there together. Revelation chapter 13. Paul, he said in Timothy, in 1 Timothy and 2 Thessalonians, people are going to wander away to doctrines of demons, that this man of sin is going to prop himself up. Revelation 13 gives us the, the most specific explanation of what that looks like. And Revelation 13 uh, John, he sees, he's in vision and he sees this beast rising up from the sea. And verses 1 and 2, it gives us the physical description of this beast. And it's exactly the same or uh, almost identical to other passages in Scripture that refer to the Antichrist. So this is this Antichrist figure. He's arisen again. Now, remember, the Protestant reformers, they correctly identified that it was the Roman Catholic papacy that was this beast that was persecuting God's people for over a thousand years. But there was a time where that persecution came to an end. This beast, it received a deadly wound. It had its power and authority taken away from it. But now John is seeing in this vision that right before the second coming of Jesus, this enemy of God's people that persecuted for so long and then was, uh, had a deadly wound, it seems to rise up again. It comes to persecute God's people one final time. Let's read verses three and four. John, he's looking at this beast and he says, I saw one of his heads as if it had been mortally wounded and his deadly wound was healed. And all the world marveled and followed the beast. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast. And they worshipped the beast, saying, Who is like the beast? And who is able to make war with him? So John sees that this power and authority that was taken away from this beast is now restored back to it. And it's restored by this dragon figure. The dragon, we're told in Revelation 12, is a symbol for Satan. Satan, he comes and again, he's playing this part of enabling this beast figure. He comes and he restores this authority. But the beast and the dragon, they have one other ally, often called either the earth beast or the false prophet. Let's read that in verses 11 and 12. There's one final ally to this kind of unholy trinity here. Verse 11, Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb and spoke like a dragon. And he exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he causes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose deadly wound was healed. Now, what's interesting to note about this false prophet, this earth beast, externally, he looks like a lamb. A lamb all throughout scripture is a symbol of 
Jesus. So externally, this earth beast, he appears to be quite Christian. But when he opens up his mouth, who does he sound like? The dragon. He sounds like Satan when he speaks. We, when, we don't have the time this morning to go through all the identifying marks of uh, who this beast is. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we understand this beast absolutely refers to not only the United States of America, but sadly, Protestant Christianity within the United States. It's this country and this faith that externally appears to be Christian, but when it speaks, it speaks like a dragon. And we're told again that uh, there's a falling away from the faith. Here we get a description of who is falling away. Many faithful Christians will be caught up in this deception when uh, Protestant Christianity apostatizes or it wanders and marvels after this beast power. So these three beasts, they come together, they form this alliance and they come together and they enforce worship. Strange, isn't it? They enforce worship. But what type of worship are they enforcing? We've got uh, the Roman papacy. We've got Protestant Christianity in America. These are both what type of faiths? Christian. Both Christian faiths. The two come together to enforce a Christian faith. Notice as well... Uh, there's, one other, there's one other element to this that we often neglect. And that is that Satan, in this kind of final effort to receive the worship and the glory and the honor that he's always wanted, Satan actually has a counterfeit second coming before Jesus' true second coming. And we're told that when he does, the, when he does this, uh, he's going to perform great miracles. He's going to go and travel the world healing people. Uh, he's going to bring s- supposedly spirits from the dead as a counterfeit second coming. He's going to go and do this kind of counterfeit second coming. Let's have a look at this next slide that describes what this kind of uh, alliance is going to look like. This is from uh, the pages of The Great Controversy from Ellen White, one of our founding uh, members of the church and someone that we believe God gave incredible insight to. She writes this, the Protestants of the United States will be foremost in stretching their hands across the gulf to grasp the hand of spiritualism. They will reach over the abyss to clasp hands with the Roman power and under the influence of this threefold union, this country will follow in the steps of Rome in trampling on the right to conscience. So she describes there's this threefold union, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet. They come together to enforce Christian worship or what appears to be Christian worship. And uh, going to the next slide, I believe. Here we go. We talked about Satan. He counterfeits a second coming. Read these words. How does Satan appeal to the Christian world? It says, Papists, Protestants, and worldlings will alike accept the form of godliness without the power, and they will see in this union, the union of the three entities, they will see in this union a grand movement for the conversion of the world and the ushering in of the long expected. It's cut off, but it says millennium. When Satan has his counterfeit second coming and he's appealing to the world to rally behind him, what is his appeal? He's here, he says, I'm Jesus, I've come to bring to the world, the long-awaited millennium. That's the appeal that he uses to deceive the world. Is understanding the events and the timing of the second coming and the millennium important? Yeah. It's going to be the thing that Satan uses to try and trip up and deceive even devout Christians. He says, papists, Protestants, and worldlings, people of every type of either religious or irreligious, are going to come together and say, wow, Jesus has come to establish his millennium. How would that look like? Well, for the secret rapture Christians, they believe there's a a millennium on heaven and on earth. And so when Satan comes and he pretends to be Jesus and he establishes an earthly kingdom, uh, he establishes the kingdom on earth, it fits very neatly 
in the secret rapture view. That's quite concerning, isn't it? The secret rapture view fits very neatly into what Satan wants to achieve. We'll go back a slide uh, for the time being. What about for the post-millennialist or the golden age view? Well, for the post-millennialist, Jesus has arrived a thousand years earlier than they expected, didn't he? They thought he's coming after, but he's arrived before. But the post-millennialist, what do they, what's their goal? We have to Christianize the world and spread it everywhere. Everyone has to be Christian. When Satan comes and he has this threefold union, what is his goal? We need to spread Christianity across the world. Everyone needs to worship this counterfeit Christ. Everyone needs to worship after the beast. Isn't it concerning that the goals of these two groups are nearly identical? Both the golden age view and Satan want to establish this golden age of the Christian faith. And Satan is willing to enforce it if he has to as well. So what we should ask ourselves is, is that view something we need to be worried about? The golden age post-millennial view. Is it something to be worried about? Didn't it decline in the 40s and the 50s after World War I and II? Well, it did decline, but in recent years it's also seen a rapid uh, expansion. It's grown immensely. Particularly, it began to rise in the 1960s and 80s. And it was in response to the fact in America, Protestant Christians were sick and tired of Christian morals and values being under attack from secular culture. And so two movements within Protestant Christianity rose up to fight against the evils of secularism. The first was called the Reconstruction Movement. The Reconstruction Movement, it was started by more Calvinist and Reformed Protestant denominations. And their goal is to restore a theocratic government in America. Theocratic means a, a religiously governed government. And interestingly, this also includes for them religiously enforcing the Sabbath. The second movement that arose is called the New Apostolic Reformation. It's also called Kingdom Now Theology. Uh, and we've got a bit of information on them in the following slides. Basically, this was very popular in Pentecostal and Charismatic churches. This belief that it's up to the Christian faith to establish God's kingdom right here, right now on earth. That was the goal. And they kind of qualified it by using something they called the seven mountain mandate. This is a belief that God has called, called them to have control over seven mountains, the mountains of family, religion, education, media, entertainment, business, and government. And they believe that once Christianity conquers these seven mountains, then they'll reach this golden age of the faith. Now, both of these movements, they're categorized often as Christian, Christian nationalistic movements. Uh, this idea that Christianity must be enforced politically from a government standpoint. Uh, it's also often called dominion theology, that Christianity must have dominion over the world. It's up to the Christians to have dominion and conquer the world for God. And they've been, both of these movements, they've slowly been growing. They started in the 60s and 80s, and they've picked up quite a bit of steam. But in recent years, they've radically expanded. Now, why might post-millennialism or well, the golden age view, have just spiked in interest in the Christian world. The past maybe decade and past few years, we have seen uh, an attack on Christianity and Christian values and morality unlike anything we've seen in history. It has been nonstop attacks and the, the way that Western cultures are going, particularly again in America, is just going so far away from God that the Protestant Christian world, in response, what are they saying? They're going, we need to do something about this. this all of the, this stuff is getting way out of hand. If only we could legislate Christian morality. If we had a Protestant Christian government, everything would be solved. If only we could create God's kingdom on earth here and now, then these evils would be put 
to a stop. This is why there's been such a, a gravitational pull in the Christian world, actually away from the secret rapture view. Secret rapture view is actually falling gradually out of favor. And more and more people are coming to this view that it's up to us to stop the evils of secularism and to put our foot down, to establish God's kingdom here on earth. Now, here's what is so important. Let's uh, just flick through the next slide. Some of the big groups in this that you might hear of, uh, those two are reformed. This axis, Hillsong Bethel, they're more the charismatic Pentecostal movements that are into the Seven Mountain Mandate. Go to the next slide. This is so important for us to understand. As Seventh-day Adventists, we see that atheism and secularism has a role to play in biblical prophecy. Uh, at the end of my PowerPoint, I'm going to have a, a link for you to go to where I've got a presentation all about atheism. It, it appears in Revelation 11. Uh, Ellen White talks about it in the Great Controversy in the chapter all about the French Revolution. Atheism has a role to play in biblical prophecy. It is an enemy of God and his people. But this is so clear that we understand atheism is not the final enemy of God's people. Right before Jesus' second coming, it's not atheism or secularism that is God's final enemy. It is what? Apostate Christianity. It's this threefold union of these, uh, uh, these beasts that externally look Christian, but in reality speak like dragons. They're apostate. They've fallen away. They succumb to this, the false coming of, uh, of Satan, this counterfeit coming. This is where postmillennialism goes astray, the Golden Age view. Postmillennialism sees atheism as the final enemy of God's people to defeat. And so the rallying call of the Golden Age view is if we just stamp out atheism and instead put in Christianity, all of our problems are fixed. We just need to get rid of atheism. That's the final enemy. And then we go into this Golden Age. But as Seventh-day Adventists, we say, no, atheism, it is an enemy of God's people. But the final enemy will actually be apostate Christianity. Very different. Very different from the post-millennialist. This is, yet again, an attempt from Satan to divert prophetic attention away from himself. Isn't it crazy to think that the broader Christian world does not see that Christianity itself will uh, eventually become that final enemy to God's people. Now, I've got a difficult question for us. Here's the question. As Seventh-day Adventists, are the promises of post-millennialism attractive or appealing to us? Let me ask it this way. Do we want to see righteous laws passed in our government? Yes, we want for that. Are we frustrated by the decline of morality and Christianity in our countries? Yes, we're frustrated. Are we tired of having secular values pushed onto us? Yes. This is a very uh, attractive, appealing view because we feel the same way as these other Christian brothers and sisters, right? We're equally as frustrated. We equally want to see righteous laws in our government. But please, uh, and... Please understand this statement. The prospect, while the prospect of having a Protestant Christian government enacting biblical laws and stamping out the evils of atheism, while it sounds appealing, prophetically, that's the exact condition that will lead to the rise of God's true enemy, which is apostate Christianity that enforces biblical values, enforces Sabbath worship, enforces Christianity on the world. It's a real spiritual danger for us, isn't it? Because we sympathize with that feeling. We sympathize with this, things are going crazy. The world's going out of control. And I believe we can pass righteous laws, laws that are in line with biblical values, but not at the expense of establishing a Protestant Christian government that we know establishes, paves the way for that, that threefold union, Revelation 13. It's possible, isn't it, to uphold righteousness from a political level without paving the way 
for that final enemy of God's people. I was visiting an Adventist church and they had some magazines out in the foyer. And uh, it wasn't an official publication of the church. It was an independent publisher, someone uh, who'd just by themselves produced a magazine for Adventists. And in the opening pages, uh, in the opening page, they had a series of declarations that were kind of the mission statement for this magazine. And I want to read them out to you and I want to see if your ears kind of ring a bit and if something feels a little off to you. Let's go to uh, the next slide to see this. What were these declarations? It's a little bit small, I apologize. I'll read them out for you. It said, We decree that America's executive branch of government will honor God and defend the Constitution. We declare that our legislative branch will write only laws that are righteous and constitutional. We decree that our judicial system will issue rulings that are biblical and constitutional. We decree that we stand against wokeness, the occult, and every evil attempted against our nation. We decree that we take back and permanently control positions of influence and leadership in each of the seven mountains. We decree that the blood of Jesus covers and protects our nation. It protects and separates us from God. Uh, We decree, uh, there should be more on the following slide, I think. Perfect. Uh, I'm up to number eight. We declare that America is strong spiritually, financially, militarily, and technologically. We decree that evil carries no power, authority, or rights in our land nor over our people. We decree that we operate in unity, going beyond the denominational lines in order to accomplish the purposes of God for our nation. And we decree that America shall be saved. This was a series of decrees found in a publication intended for Seventh-day Adventists. As soon as I was reading through this, I went, this just sounds like a lamb speaking like a dragon. What in particular kind of alerted me? that heavy emphasis on the government must enact biblical laws, has to be strictly biblical. There's an explicit reference in there to achieve, to conquering the seven mountains. The seven mountain mandate was from the the new apostolic reformation, kingdom now theology. I'm going, what on earth? How did this slip into a magazine meant for Adventists? The seven mountain mandate that's that's the kingdom now theology that's not us what's this doing uh in in this what about uh, that declaration to kind of erase denominational lines to come together in unity oh that sent alarm bells ringing through my head that's exactly the description of revelation 13 the whole christian world comes together the denominations are put aside we're coming together to enforce christian worship And what what is the inciting incident for this? I think it's Declaration 4, which says, We decree that we stand against wokeness, the occult, and every attempt against our nation. Now, I I researched this, and I found out it was a uh, New Apostolic Reformation series of declarations. They just borrowed it and put it into this publication. But it really opened my eyes to this idea that this this theology is tempting to us as Adventists because we should be against wokeism, the occult, and every evil attempt against people, right? We should be against the fact that our our countries uh, have just gone rapidly endorsing evils, uh, such as the, the sad abortion that we see in the world, or attempts to divide people by race, or the confusion that Uh, young people are going through to do with sexuality and gender there are so many things that we should rightly be against and we should seek for righteous laws to be upheld and enacted we should seek to have righteousness established in our countries and yet not at the expense of the installation of a christian government per se or a government that we know will pave the way for that threefold union in Revelation 13. There is a temptation for us as Seventh-day Adventists to go away from the view of the second coming of millennium which God has given to us and go towards this other one that in the here and now sounds very attractive. If we can put an end to all of these evils and make everyone Christian, then things will be right. 
but it's 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 being rooted in scripture it's about being rooted in what god has revealed to us through ellen white being rooted in god's truth so we don't get tempted to go in that direction i'm going to conclude by saying this we we began this morning by saying that god Again, God does not expect you when you get to heaven to give a perfect prophecy time chart. But does understanding prophecy matter? Yes. Does understanding when the second coming and the millennium happens, will, does that matter? It has such eternal consequences. And sadly, many people who hold to perhaps the secret rapture or the golden age view, when Satan comes and this threefold union is formed, many of those people will fall for that deception because of an an incorrect view of the millennium. So with this true understanding of what it looks like, there's actually a burden of responsibility on us, isn't there? To share the truth of the second coming and of the millennium with other people, with other fellow Christians and say, no, it's not going to happen like this. Let's go through scripture. Here's what the second coming and the millennium actually looks like. Here's what we're looking forward to when Jesus returns. And it's important for us to continue studying the Bible as well so that we're prepared. There's there's no depths that we can ever get to the bottom to when it comes to reading and studying Scripture. So it's on us to continue studying this topic, increasing our knowledge and learning of the books of prophecy. I'm going to invite maybe Sarval and uh, Laurie to just distribute around a few pens you'll see there's some little cards beside you or in front of you uh, with the second coming written on it and i just want to give this opportunity for us to really think and reflect on our preparedness for jesus second coming there's three little things on there the first is a little box uh, giving you the opportunity for yourself to affirm that you want to be prepared and ready for Jesus' second coming. What that looks like will be uh, continuing that relationship with God daily, developing that character, studying scripture to understand prophecy even greater. That's the the commitment that we make when we say, I want to be ready for Jesus' second coming. The second box there you'll see uh, is an opportunity for you to ask a question. Uh, So this isn't... uh, If you tick that box, you're not going to get me calling you on the phone every second day. This is, if you've got a question about the second coming or the millennium that you would like answered, tick that box. Uh, I know there's not quite enough room to write it on the little sheet there. But when I contact you, you can say, here's the question that I've got. If there's some area of the second coming or the millennium that you'd like to know more about or are a bit unsure of, Tick that box and we can have a quick chat together about it. We can spend time unpacking uh, this very important topic together. And thirdly, there um, is just an opportunity for you to write something you'd like prayer for. Uh, As your pastor, I really, uh, it's a privilege for me to be able to pray for all of us here as a church family. And so if there's something that uh, you'd like for me to keep in prayer for you during the week, please write that down and I'll make sure as well that you know Uh, that I've kept that in prayer for you. As you're perhaps writing there, I just want to finish uh, once again in Revelation 20. Because this morning, by nature of being prepared and aware and ready for the second coming, we've had to talk a lot about the deceptions of Satan. But I don't want for us to leave from here thinking that Satan's the one who comes out on top. Because... Satan, he does his counterfeit second coming. But when Jesus comes to do the true second coming, there's nothing Satan can do. Satan is powerless when Jesus arrives. And we talked about in, we read verses four and six this morning of how God and his people, when he comes and he takes them to heaven, they reign with him for a thousand years. And it's a time of safety and peace and security. But why is it that? It's because of what happens in the first three verses of Revelation 20. These are the final verses we'll read this morning. John, as he's watching this vision, he says, I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. He laid hold of that dragon, that serpent of old, who is the devil and Satan, 
and he bound him for a thousand years. He cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Why is the millennium this time of peace and safety and security for God's people? It's because Satan is bound. Satan is powerless. Satan is trapped on the earth and there's nothing he can do. All he's doing is awaiting his final sentencing. And it says that he's released for a little while. After the millennium, he's released for a little while, but only so that he can receive that justice that's been coming his way for over 6,000 years. And when Satan finally receives that justice, the world is free of sin. And God and his people, all the universe are singing in unison that God is love. The question for us this morning is, do we want to be there at the second coming? Do we want to be there at the millennium, as we said in the children's story? Do we want to be at the big celebration, the party that God is going to have with his people when he comes to take them home? That is the challenge for us this morning. Do you want to be ready and prepared for the second coming and be there in that millennium with God? Let's stand and let's sing our final song this morning, all about how we are going to meet Jesus and get to heaven one day.